Okay, we're going to take a look at how we describe new species and a lot more detail about how we name plants, that is a formal nomenclature for plants, scientific nomenclature. We're also going to learn a little bit about why this guy is so famous. This is, of course, Carlos Linnaeus. He invented the system of binomial nomenclature, and we will talk a little bit about why that nomenclature is so important in science. We're going to start with a description of the process that we use when we collect and name a new species. So let's just say that you are out there in the field and you're a trained botanist. You already know all the things that you would do in this course, plus you've been working in naming species for a number of years. So let's call you a trained systematist. And you're out there in the field, perhaps in the tropics where not too many other people have been, and suddenly you see something that's unusual. Something specifically a plant. And it's unusual because you don't know it. Now, as an expert in the flora of that region, the flora are the list of plants or the number of plants that are in a, occur in a certain region, and you're an expert on that flora, you know most of the plants in that region, but this one you don't know. So now you think that you might have found something new. What do you do? This is your chance, maybe, to name a new species. How would you go about that? So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. Okay, collecting and naming a new species. So the first thing you're going to do, you're going to collect a specimen of that plant in the field. And you're going to collect it in a special way. You're going to make what's called a herbarium specimen. This is a dried specimen. It's flattened. So you've taken the plant, the live plant, and you've put it between two boards and some cardboard in there, and you have um, flattened those things together. You've actually stepped on these two boards with the plant in between them, and you've squished it all down. You've made some notes about what you put in that between those two pieces of paper, and you dried it. And there's a number of ways you can do to dry that, but you end up with a dried piece of the plant. And that's going to piece of the plant, that herbarium specimen, is going to be placed in a scientific plant collection called a herbarium, which we'll come back to later in the course and talk more about. So you've got your unknown plant now, and you've made a copy of it or a collection of it. And now you need to know if someone else has really described this already or not. Now, because you're an expert in this uh, <clears throat> area of the world, you're pretty sure that they haven't. But you've got to make sure. And so one thing you might do is you might lose a key to key it out. We talked about key in a previous video. And so you might get a good key to the region and make sure that you have um, tried to identify it and you're not able to do it. You can consult a good herbarium. So if you're in Costa Rica, say, and you're doing this work, you go to the National Museum in Costa Rica and look at the dried plant specimens they have there and to try to compare your new dried specimen with the ones that are there and see if anyone else has discovered this plant already. You might also consult monographic revisions of this, what you think the new genus is. So we're assuming now it's a new species, not a new genus. <clears throat> and so you could look at people who have written up descriptions of that genus. Those descriptions are written in what are called monographs. Mono means one. Graphic, graphis means um, writing. So a monograph is a, essentially a book that is published that 
um, codifies all of the knowledge about a given taxon, perhaps a given genus, and publishes that in a way accessible to other botanists. Let's look at some examples of those. First, we'll look at this systematic botany monographs. This website is <clears throat> by the American Association of Plant Taxonomists, and it is a website, not a website, but it's a website that where they link to descriptions of monographs. So here are some of the latest volumes in this publication series, Systematic Botany Monographs. So here is a <clears throat> revision of a genus in the family Melastomataceae. Here is a, regenus, <clears throat> a revision of a group, a part of the genus Ficus. That's the genus that's figs. Those are the figs that you might eat from the grocery store. It's one part of that genus, and they've revised that and placed it here. So let's say you think you've got a new species of fig. This is one of the monographic revisions you would want to consult about that to see if someone else has already described that. Here is a monographic revision um, of a plant, Renealmia. This is one of the genera that I've worked on, not on the taxonomy, but on other aspects. And you can see again, this was published in a, <clears throat> a monograph of the genus Renealmia. Here's the author of that monograph. It was published in a <clears throat> journal or a periodical called Flora Neotropica, the flora of the Neotropics, and it was published in 1997, 1977. We can go on and look at some of the pages in this, published by the New York Botanical Gardens. So there's an introduction, the first thing that they do, a little bit of a historical survey. We'll page through just some of this quickly, the morphology of the plant, describing its structure. Some photographs of different parts of the structure that are useful in the taxonomy. These are descriptions of the hairs. We'll learn about terminology for hairs, although I'm not going to hold you responsible for learning these terms. We'll talk a little bit about them later in the course. Some photographs of the hairs, etc. Descriptions of subparts um, sub of the gen genus. This is a revision of the whole genus. And eventually, we're going to get to, as we go on, the section on the systematic treatment, which is the majority of this monograph. And each <clears throat> section of this systematic treatment is going to describe a species and describe things about that species. Right now, we're not going to go through all of the parts that are in this monograph about each species, but I'm <clears throat> we'll do that sometime later. But right now, I'm just going to show you that here is a description of this species. There it is. Oh, this is actually the genus. Let's find a species. Ah, uh, we have the key here. We're into the descriptions of the species now. I want to find the beginning of one. Okay, there is it. There's the beginning of a description of a species. It's got the scientific name. It's got some other information there about where that name was published. It's got a description of it, etc. And it's going to go on to have other kinds of information about that species. Because this is a very complete and great monograph, um, the author of this does a very beautiful job of in his monographs, and he's got illustrations of every species. So you can consult those illustrations to see if it looks like yours. And there's going to be listings here of herbarium specimens that represent that species. And so you could consult those herbaria if you needed to find out if you've got a new species. So you're basically doing your homework when you're doing this. You're doing your homework to find out if you've got a new species or not. You can also consult an authority on the group of plants. 
So if you were working on Renealmia, you thought you had a new species of Renealmia from Costa Rica, you would consult Paul Moss and ask him if he knows of this species or if it could be new. Once you've done all of that and you're pretty sure that you've got a new species, so this, is, this parallel here is making sure making sure that it's a new species. So once you've done all of that, you want to publish the name. You want to publish your name. You're going to name it, and you're going to publish that name. And there now are now our rules that are set down for how you're going to publish that name in order to get the scientific community to take it seriously. If you don't follow these rules, the scientific community, other systematists, just can ignore your name. They won't, they won't pay attention to your work. So you've got to follow these rules. And these rules were laid down in a document called the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants. And we'll say a little bit more about this code as we go on and talk about nomenclature. But so the rules that I'm going to talk about now, the rules for valid publication, rules you have to follow in order to get your work taken seriously, are laid down in this document the International Code of Nomenclature for algae, algae, Fungi, and Plants. The first part of that code says that your name has to be properly constructed and not previously used. No one else could have used that name before, and it has to be properly constructed, which means it has to be in Latin grammar. So you've got to learn a little bit of how Latin works in order to describe new species. Now, in this course, we're not going to teach you very much Latin, a little bit, but not very much. So the little bit we're going to do is about right now. So what does it mean that it has to be properly constructed in Latin grammar? Well, Latin is a gendered language, so there are male and female endings. So the endings of the generic name and the species name, the specific epithet, have to be the same. So they must agree in gender. So in the case where you have a female ending of the generic name, <clears throat> let's say that it ends in A, which would be a female ending, the specific epithet must also end in A. If you have an ending that ends in UM, which is a male ending, on the generic name, the <clears throat> specific epithet must also end in U-M. There is, however, one type of exception. And that exception has to do with honorifics. An honorific is a name that is created to honor someone. So it, this applies to the specific epithet, not to the generic name, but these specific epithets can be constructed to honor someone. So you will see these sometimes during the course, and you will see sometimes Specific epithets end in I, I. That is a male ending. It means the person being honored was male. If you see an ending that is AE or IAE, those are female honorifics. So, for instance, just say that 
you follow up and you become a systematist after this wonderful course and you decide to honor your professor, yes please, with a naming a species after him. And we'll just say that's the genus Planta. And now the specific epithet would be my last name. I'm assuming you're going to honor me now. And that, so that would be Kirchhoff. And because it's an honorific, we put I-I at the end, Kirchhoffii, Planta Kirchhoffii. Okay, please do that. So it has to be in Latin grammar, not previously used, properly constructed. The first rule. Well, I've kind of gotten my head of myself in some of this because I haven't really explained binomial nomenclature yet. I've been talking about it. But here's a slide that explains it. So the generic name, the genus name, is the first part of the binomial, two names. So bi, two, nomium, name, two names. And it goes back, of course, to Linnaeus, that fellow who we, picture we had on the first slide. So the first part of that name is the generic name. It's capitalized and italicized. It, these the words are italicized because there's a convention in English that when you're using a word that's in a foreign language, you should italicize it. And so we italicize the names of genus and species because they are in a foreign language. They're in Latin. The second part of the species name is the specific epithet. The specific epithet is not capitalized. It's in italics again. In this case, it's dromosa of the species Quercus dromosa. So there it is. That is the species name. So the species name is this binomial. Species name is the binomial. Okay, the species name is not the second name. This second name, that's the specific epithet. So an epithet, that's a noun or an adjective that is in some way descriptive of the thing being described. You've probably heard this word being used in not such nice contexts when someone says a racial epithet. That means they're using some, usually some bad word to describe someone who the speaker thinks has some characteristic that is not flattering. In this case, we try to use specific epithets that describe in some way the genus. That is not always true, but we would love for all the taxonomists to write good specific epithets. And a good one I would consider is something like, let's say, Quercus alba. So Quercus, which one are we talking about? We're talking about the one that is alba. Alba means white in Latin. So Quercus alba is the white oak. And it's called white because on the back of the leaves of these oaks, they have um, white hairs. OK, so that's the specific epithet. Who is this guy named here afterwards? What's this thing after the binomial name? Well, this is actually part of the formal binomial. Nuttall, here, Thomas Nuttall, is the person who described this species. That is, he coined this binomial. He was the person who did the process that we're just talking about and went through the process of validly publishing the name Quercus damosa. We will talk more about those authors as we go along. They're incredibly important and a formal scientific name always occurs, or always contains the author's name after the genus and the specific epithet. Well, why do we think that scientific names are better than um, non-scientific names? Well, they're universal. They're used everywhere in the world. So I have um, books that were published in Chinese, and all the whole text is in Chinese, except for the scientific names, and the scientific names are in Latin. So even in China, we use, as scientific language, um, 
we use the scientific name. So the same worldwide. They're consistent. Each one has only one and only one, and I'm going to say something to one and only one correct name. And we'll come back to that, what a correct name means. It's a little more complex than you might think, but each one, each, each taxon has only one correct name. They can have more than one common name, one more than one common correct name. So my favorite example of this is the yam. I teach in the southern United States, and everyone in the south knows that when you're going to eat yams, you um, take and you harvest those roots, you cut them up very finely, you mash them up in a pot, and you boil them as hard as you can, and then you take the water from that, and you throw it out, and you bring the stuff of the yam back into another pot, and you boil them again, and you throw the water out. And you do that about three times. And once you've done all that, you've removed all the toxins from the yam, and then you're uh, safe to use um, to cook. Uh, oh, you think I'm talking about um, the yam of the South because I said I teach in the South. No, I'm talking about the yam of South America, which is poisonous if you eat it without going through the process of removing all the toxins. So you see the problem with common names. They can mean very, very different things and sometimes have really bad consequences if you don't know the plant that you're dealing with. Common names also tell us nothing about the taxonomic rank. They don't tell us whether they were talking about a genus. So if we say oaks, right, I must, when I saw that oak, well, does that mean you, what oak did you see? We don't really know from that. Whereas if you go say, oh, I saw Quercus alba, we know exactly what you saw. You know lots of things about that plant. Many plants don't have common names. I was talking to colleagues in Brazil about the common names they use, and they just said most everything here does not have a common name in Portuguese. And so that's a real problem for them. If they want to talk to other people about it, they can't talk to, about common names. So in addition to having <clears throat> a con correctly constructed name, the rank of the taxon must be indicated. So the rank, that means whether it's a new species, a new genus, etc. what? Now, usually they're new species. Sometimes you can have new subspecies, etc. constructed. But let's just use two examples. If it's a new species, someplace in the description of that plant, you're going to see S, P, N, O, V, species novum, a new species. If it's a new genus, someplace in the description we're going to see G, E, N, N, O, V, meaning it is a new genus. And usually that appears right after the authority, the person's name, who's describing the species. So that when you first describe it, it's clear what rank this new taxon has. Now, it should be clear from other things, but this is really very legalistic language. The people who do these kinds of things are very, very careful. And so these, this procedure means that there's no mistaking what level of um, what rank we are at. A type specimen has to be designated. A type specimen is a herbarium specimen. So it's that dried plant specimen that you were out there and collect, collecting. Now the name is specifically associated with that specimen. I'm going to even say forever. So it's associated with that herbarium specimen. Well, let's look at a herbarium specimen, and then we'll come back to that point. So here's what a herbarium specimen looks like. This is from 
the textbook Simpson, and this is a really wonderful example of a herbarium specimen, beautifully put together. You can see there are dried plant parts here. This was from a very large plant, so just a part of the plant is put down here, representative part. They put photographs on here, which is a great addition to herbarium specimens to show what it looked like in life. Um, there is a label down here, which we'll talk about later what goes on that label, but the name of the species is going to be on there. There's a little fragment here in case something falls off. So suppose something falls off of this, one of these spines falls off. In that case, you'd take that spine and you'd put it in this label, in this little packet, so that you don't lose it. I mean, there might there's some DNA in that spine and someone may need a piece of this plant to do some molecular work and there it goes. They've got it in the packet already, so it's saved. There's other things on here like the succession number. This is a number that's assigned when it's put into the herbarium so that they can always find it. It's a unique number for that herbarium. And this specimen, if it is a type specimen, is primarily associated with the name. So here is a type specimen. There is an official type. This is from a plant in Australia. It's got this beautiful red label on it. Actually, it's an ugly red label, but it's very important to know that it's a type specimen. It's going to say down on the, um, the name is going to appear down here on these labels. And so the name of this plant, Hachia rugosa, is permanently associated with this dried plant. Okay, permanently associated with this specimen. So that's very important. Now what that means is <clears throat> that every time someone applies that name, Hachia rugosa, they're doing it on the basis of comparison with this specimen. That's a little weird idea here, so let's make sure we understand it. The only plant that we know 100% is Hachia rugosa, is this thing here. It's a dried plant, it's dead, it's sitting in a herbarium in Australia. This is the only one we know 100% is that species. We can't have any doubt about that whatsoever. Any other plant, a living plant for instance, even one that was growing right next to this one, well, maybe we made a mistake. You know, maybe there's something that looks very similar to it. Now, I mean, we could be, especially if they were growing right next to it, we could be, you know, 99.999% certain that it's the same thing as this. But the only one we are, the only plant we are 100% certain is really, Hickey rugosa is this one on this specimen. Everything else is by comparison. It can be comparison based on description of the plant. It can be comparison based on DNA evidence. If you take a little piece off of this and do some DNA work on it, you could create a DNA barcode, for instance, and maybe determine that they're very similar and so it must be the same species, etc. So this gives you a little bit of an insight into how taxonomists think. They want absolute certainty when you can get it. And this is something that is absolute certain this dried plant is absolutely this name, and it was just collected by Robert Brown, collected and named by Robert Brown. Here is the plant growing in a little seaside area in Australia. So you can see that when we dry these plants, we lose a lot of detail for them. And it's really nice to have photographs associated with the herbarium specimens too. Okay, a type specimen has to be designated. There has to be a description of the plant. Remember I just said that almost all identifications are made based on comparison with the type specimen. 
Well, one way to compare it is you describe that type specimen when you publish it, and <clears throat> people can look at that description and say, ah, well, do I have the same thing or not? These descriptions can be incredibly important. <clears throat> they are often made in notebooks in the field so that they have a person is standing there next to the plant and looking at it. And some of the very old ones were done um, <clears throat> in the 1800s, 1700s. And when these plant explorers were out in really wild places in Borneo or um, South America, and they made the plant, <clears throat> the dried plant specimens for shipping back to their home countries, they often were coming from Europe, they would find that these plants were lost in the process of transporting them back to, let's say, England. So travel was not very secure during those days, and the ship goes down and everything is lost on it. The person, maybe, the plant collector is still in South America, but his collections are lost. And so all he's got and all posterity has are his descriptions of the plants. So the descriptions can be incredibly important to determine um, that this guy actually saw the plant and described it. So there has to be a description when it's published. <clears throat> Prior to 2011, that description had to be in Latin. By about 2011, there were very few systematists who could speak Latin really well, and it was getting very difficult to describe these plants in Latin. And also, the scientific language had changed from Latin to English. So for hundreds of years, scientists had communicated in Latin. By 2011, even very conservative taxonomists had recognized that English was the language of science. Chinese scientists were almost certainly not going to speak Latin very well, but they could and do speak English very well. So after 2011, the description of the plant, and this is wrong, had to be in English. Wait a minute. Up to 2011, it had to be in, in Latin. After 2011, it can be in English. After 2011, uh, Latin description is encouraged, but it's not required, and many descriptions of new descriptions of plants do not have descriptions in Latin. Well, let's look at a <clears throat> publication that follows all of these rules describing a new species. This is a species in the sunflower family. It was published in the journal Systematic Botany. Here is the name in Latin down here, and it's a new species. Let me <clears throat> enlarge a little bit of this diagram so we can see some of the other parts here. We can see over here there is a type specimen that's been indicated, described where it is in detail, and described where they have placed in herbaria. There's these abbreviations used for herbaria. You can look them up if you need to know where they, what they are, but they've been used for hundreds of years, so some of them have been used for hundreds of years. So they describe where the herbaria are and where the type specimen is placed. There is a Latin description because this was prior to 2011. And there is a description in the vernacular language of this person who wrote it, which was English. Which was allowed under the other rules. Wasn't required, but it was allowed to have a vernacular description. Again, we can see better over here. We see on the left, we see there's the species name. There are the authors. And there is the rank, a new species.
So the <clears throat> description of the plant sub in English, and it was validly published, effectively published rather. It's published in a journal accessible to other botanists, and we saw that here. It was published in the journal Systematic Botany. So not only do you have to do all of these things, but you've got to publish it in a way that other botanists have access to it. You can't just write it in your notebook and say, oh, I've discovered a new species, etc. That's the end of it. You have to make it available to other botanists for review um, and comment. Well, that completes our study of valid publication. We know a little bit about what the International Code of Nomenclature says about what you would do if you discovered a new species. In another video, we're going to move on and talk about the rules of nomenclature.